guys, we want to welcome everybody back. We're in the book of First Peter. First Peter is very interesting. The first twelve verses is a declaration of what has happened, what is the truth. We are saved by grace through faith. We have an inheritance. Nobody's going to take that inheritance from us. Peter is declaring a truth to the people. He names who the people are. This book is being written to the people in Turkey from Babylon. You got to remember when the people of Judea went into captivity. They went into captivity in three different segments. Nebuchadnezzar came up from Babylon. He took Judah and they rebelled. He took Judah and they rebelled. And finally, he just burned it all up. He said, you're not going to rebel against me anymore. There will be none of it. And God had told Jeremiah to preach the word. When Babylon comes to get us, because they are, because you're wicked, and it's time for you to be judged, when they come, don't resist them. Hey, guys, don't take the war upon yourself, what, how you think you need to fight it there, patriot. Okay? You need to listen to the voice of God and say, God, how should I fight this war coming up? Because we're in a war. We've been in a continual war since day one, since the Garden of Eden. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes up as God's locust, as his servant, and he comes up to Judah, and he takes Judah at God's bidding. Judah had sinned and sinned and sinned, and they sinned for 490 years against the land of Israel. You don't think the land of Israel is important to God? He got mad when they didn't let it rest. How much more angry is he going to get when they try to steal it from him, from his friend Abraham? And that's what's on the table right now. The deal of the century with Trump and his son-in-law. And they're going out there and they're going to they're gonna work the deal, work the magic, work to shake their jelly up in the world. And God says, you're going to shake your jelly, I'll shake my jelly. He's going to bring it and you'll have another Nebuchadnezzar on the scene. He's going he's gonna to wipe out nations. And that's what's happening. And so when God commanded the uh, Israelite through Jeremiah, when you see Babylon come, you go to Babylon with them. And there were three groups of people who traveled down to Babylon and they repopulated that area, or populated the area with Jews for 70 years. At the end of 70 years, God gave them their land back, God gave them restoration, and he redeemed them back in the land. And only few in number in comparison, relatively, you know, came back. The rest of them stayed in Babylon. And that's where Peter went to. Why? Because Jesus said, I want you 12 preaching to the lost sheep of Israel. I got another guy. I need him to go to the Gentiles. You guys go to the lost sheep of Israel. And Peter chooses to go back down to where the captivity took place and where the Jews were growing in leaps and bounds and huge numbers. And he wanted to take the gospel down there. And he's writing from Babylon to the churches in Asia Minor up there in Turkey. And he gives them some declarations, and he says, guys, here's how you're saved. You're saved by believing. When the blood is applied, man, you are saved immediately. There's three points of salvation, three, three spurts of salvation, three periods of salvation. There is the, I'm saved immediately, and as soon as you immerse yourself by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, recognizing there's no other way you can be saved except through grace, faith, grace, faith, grace, believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when you come to that point in your spirit, and you recognize it, and you Yield yourself over to that fact. And you say, I am in desperate need of a Savior. I'm in desperate need of you, God. I'm in desperate need to get rid of me. You trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, knowing you can't get yourself to heaven. You can't do anything about yourself. You can't make you good. But only the blood of Jesus can. And you plunge yourself into that flood. You are saved immediately. You're saved. You're now in a spiritual tug of war. Between your body, your flesh, the world, sin, Satan, and this new redeemed spirit that cannot sin any longer. Now, Satan wants to come and he wants to mess up our soul. He wants to keep our soul. That's your personality. He wants to keep you acting so much more like the world. That's his game plan. If you can act like the world, act like sin, and on your way to heaven, why do that? One of the worst things that ever happened to me was joining the Southern Baptist Convention joining the Southern Baptist Church. I grew up independent Baptist. Those guys were just too strict. They were too legalistic. They were too, they preached too much of the Bible. They had so many rules, da, da, da. So I joined the Southern Baptist where they were more lax. They, they understood freedom in Christ and grace, da, da, da. And I didn't realize how stupid I was when I did that. Because what I did, I became lenient in my soul and I, it kept me leaning more toward my flesh instead of the spirit in which God saved he turned me into Christ's likeness, and he wanted me to be more like Christ. And instead of becoming more like Christ, I wanted to become more, more like the world and be saved. And that's the spirit that permeates that denomination right now. 
They love their rock concerts. They love going out at night. They love doing this. They love their shows. They love all this. They love everything in Babylon. While they once saved, always saved, and they're right in that. Their spirit is saved. It was saved. They immerse themselves by faith in grace, but they're not growing in their soul. Their soul's not being changed under righteousness. Peter gives us these declarations right here, man. And this is called the you Southern Baptists and everybody else to get back to the Bible, get back to the Word, and come out of Babylon. And that's the message today. There's a declaration of salvation, how we're saved. And the battle is on. And Satan wants to come. And he wants to keep you on his side. He wants to keep you on the world side, the fleshly side, the sinful side. And he's going to have a battle in your mind. That's where the battle takes place. Is your mind. He'll come and he'll interject thoughts there. Guys, so many times, most of the time, you can't do anything about that first thought that makes its way into your mind. It's what you do with it once it gets there. And you need to confess to the Father, this is not of me. I am saved. I am spirit-filled. My life has been quickened, and my spirit cannot and does not and will not, and it refuses to sin. This is not my spirit doing this. This is in spiritual warfare. I'm in warfare right now, and the devil has come against me. My flesh has come against me. My old life has come against me. My wicked desires of this Babylon world has come against me, and I'm standing against that now because I need my soul here in the middle leaning more toward the saved spirit than the lost flesh and the lost world. And we have to make decisions with our minds, and that's what Peter's telling us to do because the Holy Spirit told him what to do, and he told us, that the scripture is written by holy men of God who were moved by God. And that's what we looked at last week. We've got 66 books in the Bibles and in the Bible, and God gave one person this truth and one person that truth about salvation, about the Messiah coming, about the cross, about the resurrection, about the millennium. And these guys, when they were writing this stuff in the Old Testament, they didn't know there were two different occasions happening. They didn't know there would be a birth of Christ, a 2,000 year gap called the church, and then where Christ Jesus would set up his millennium. They thought it was all the same time when Jesus showed up, he was going to set up his millennium. And so that's what all the Jews were looking for when he got here, but they wouldn't even recognize the fact that he got here. And he's finally on the scene. They were looking for a Messiah, and he shows up and says, I'm the Messiah. And he confessed that truth a couple times, said, I'm God. And boy, they didn't like that. Because they really weren't looking for him to come. They didn't want it to be him. They wanted their Messiah of their choosing. They wanted to make their God in their image against God's commands in Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, any God unto your likeness. You see, when God made us, he made Adam after his likeness. And since then, we've been trying to make God in our likeness, how we like him to be. And I like the Hindu God, and I like the Muslim God, and I like this God, and I like the Vatican Jesus, and I like the uh, Jehovah's Witness Jesus, and I like the Mormon Jesus. I, I don't like the Bible Jesus. And we make him after our own likeness, after our wickedness, after our flesh. Peter comes along and says, do not do that. Here's who God is. Here's what salvation is. And when you get saved, you have an eternal inheritance in heaven waiting for you that will not fade away. God has you in this hand. He has your inheritance in this hand. Neither are going to be removed from his hand. And one day soon, you're going to be joining and the two will come together, his inheritance and you. Right now, we live by faith. The Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us according to that blessed hope, that lightly hope that is in us. He said, man, these men, they wrote the Bible and they, they wrote portions of the Bible and they didn't understand it. And last week we looked at that. We saw the prophets who wrote, the writers who wrote. We saw the preachers who preached. We saw them filled with the Spirit as they wrote and as they preached. We saw the angels observing and keeping people saved all along the way. We looked at the angels. There's many kinds of angels, but there's no saved angel. There was a group, you read the book of Enoch, who went to Enoch and said, dude, we, we realize that we have blown it major with the Father. Can you go on our behalf and represent us to the Father and ask him if we can be forgiven? And he did that, and the Father told him, no way. There are no forgiven angels because Jesus didn't become an angel to die as their substitute in their place. But he did become a man. And all men everywhere who are sinners can now be saved because Jesus took your pain, your punishment, your sin, your sorrow, your chastisement, your judgment upon himself. And if you'll just believe in that, You'll have that eternal inheritance that won't fade away. You'll never be lost again. And one day you'll meet up with that inheritance. That's our blessed and lively hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We go today from the declaration of truth, the foundation of truth, what salvation is and from whom it comes and for who it is. Believers in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It will not fade away. And we find ourselves in verse 13 today. And he says, wherefore, because of that, because of this foundation, because of these truths that were just laid earlier in these first 12 verses, gird up, the loins of your mind. Gird up is an interesting 
little phrase here, we see that when we're wearing the armor of God, we're to gird ourselves up in the girdle of truth, the belt of truth. And a warrior, back in those days, we, we can picture seeing the movies that we saw and the photographs and pictures that we've seen, is a man's war robe consisted of a long robe that was down to the ground. And it was great for practical, everyday use, walking against thorn bushes and stuff as he would walk through the wilderness and things like that, get snake bite and all that other jazz. It was, it was very practical. But when it came time to make your advancement sure, and you had to make quick moves, and you had to make forcible moves, and you didn't want anything slowing you down, think wedding dress. Think wedding dress on the day of a wedding. The girls, they all rehearsal in, in their blue jeans and shorts the night before, and things are fine how they walk up there with daddy, but you get them in there the next day in their wedding dress, they're walking a little different or they're stumbling. And you don't go girding up your wedding dress on wedding dress day. You let the wedding gown flow. Because all they got to do is they got to get to the altar. And God says, but you're getting farther than the altar. You, the altar's where it started with us in salvation. Now it's time for us to get our minds right. It's time for you, instead of just being all lazy and laid back and lackadaisically in your thinking and letting church happen to you, and I'm going to join this denomination because they ain't as strict as that other one. And I'm going to listen to that preacher. Whatever that preacher says is fine. I'm going to go tell people, well, my preacher thinks it's okay. My preacher thinks it's fine. He's, he's cool with it. Instead of getting into the Word of God and knowing what God says and making it your own foundation, your own tent peg, your own surety that is not going to fade away or move, you're going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you're totally in the Word of the Lord which fadeth not away and is a permanent foundation. We need to build our house, our lives on the Word of God. And the Christians today, guys, it's hard. It's hard for me to find Christians in my workplace, out and about, who want to talk about Jesus longer than three minutes. After three minutes, they feel threatened. After three minutes, they got to change the subject. After three minutes, their, their smile kind of eh, gets fading fast. They, they can't keep their smile, smile up. Uh, Jesus, we're still talking about him. Good night. What's this world coming to? You know what's happened? If you disobeyed the scriptures, you know what the book of First Peter is all about? The book of First Peter is this is how you be, you, you be a Christian. This is how you live the life. This is how you do it. This is what Christianity is. This is what it is not. It is this and it ain't this. And this is how you need to do it. You need to do it right. And he begins the whole thing when telling us how to do it. He goes from telling us what it is, what is salvation, what is the foundation, what is everything about it, unto telling us how to go about it. The very first thing he says is, wherefore, because these truths have been laid down, here's what you've got to do. You've got to gird up the garment of your loins, of your mind. You remember when they were coming out of Egypt on Passover night, God told them, you're getting ready to leave, I want you to eat prepared, I want you to get your clothes on, and when you get ready to leave, I want you to take your long gowns and tuck them in your belt like you're going to be going to war. They turned them into like a pair of shorts. And they got them, got them up off their legs, they got them up off their knees to where they had freedom of movement. He said, I want you to leave ready, ready for war, ready for, to run, ready to fly in the night. He told him that. And when Jesus that night up in the upper room, when he washed their feet, he lifted up his skirt and got it ready because it was time for him to work. You know how we'd say it in our vernacular day? Roll up your sleeves, boys. It's time to get, get busy. Roll up your sleeves. Roll up the sleeves of your mind. Roll up the sleeves of your heart. He doesn't say heart. He says mind. Roll up the sleeves of your mind. Get your thinking right. Get your thinking Bible-based, God-based in the Word. What these prophets brought you through the Holy Spirit, what these preachers have been preaching from that Word through the Holy Spirit, it's time for you to, on your own, gird up the loins of your mind and get ready to advance, boom, with brisk haste, with firmness, with a steadfast purpose, with a goal in mind looking unto Jesus. I have a job to do, and it's that way, and I'm prepared to do it. I'm not going to sit back here and just wait for the preacher to preach me a good sermon one day, and I'll like that. I had a buddy, man. This guy, he was as carnal as they get. He wasn't godly working. He went to church every week, though. And one day, he was up on vacation in Atlanta, Georgia, in his old forty. And while he's up there, his car broke down. He heard a message that day. When your group dries up, it's time to move on. And Elijah was at the brook, boy, and he birds was feeding him. And the water was trickling. He had water and he had roast beef sandwiches. And birds feeding him roast beef and bread, boy. 
one day that dirt dried up and you had to move on. So I went out and bought me a new car. The Lord told me to get when the brick dries up, just move on and go out and buy a new car. And that's the only thing I remember him t- t- the Lord ever telling him. I remember the Lord telling him a whole lot more than that that he wouldn't do. He goes, it ain't a matter of judging folks. It's a matter of you walking alongside people wanting them to come along with you. You know where we're going. Well, I've girded up the loins of my mind. you girded up the loins of your mind. We're headed that way. We are headed away from the world to the cross. I am not part of this world. And it's time for me to gird up the, the loins of my mind. Get, get your skirt away from a tripping distance, from a slow pace distance. You get that skirt out of your way, unencumbered, man. You get that thing, don't make it an obstacle. Your walk, don't let your walk be an obstacle. You be free in your walk. You be free in your run. You be free in your war. You be free in your battle. We're called to fight. We're in a battle. Gird up the loins of your mind. And guys, you're going to win the battle when your mind is right. Your mind's not right until your mind's right with God. When that battle comes like we talked earlier, man, your spirit cannot sin. It will not sin. It hates sin. That new Savior, that's how you know you're saved or not. There's a part in you that hates sin, and it really hates your own personal sin. The sin that nobody else, the, the thoughts of your mind. When you realize that the thoughts of your mind aren't being girded up right now, and there, there's there's something fighting it, and you realize and you wake up and you go, oh, oh. Okay, we've got to take care of that. And God's calling us to get our minds right. And here's a good thing to do. When those thoughts come that interject themselves into your mind, the devil's there, your past is there haunting you. How many of you got a past that likes to knock on the door a lot? Anybody? Hmm? Yeah, I hate my past. Moving on. You know, we're supposed to hate our accolades, our blessings from the past. When I won the state championship back here 30 years ago, I'm supposed to move on from that too. And go on, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And God wants us in this word. He wants us fighting this word. He wants us speaking this word. He wants us to gird up the loins of our mind and get our minds thinking only things that are godly unto Jesus. And wherefore, because this foundation's been laid, because Jesus did all the work and all you had to do is believe. And the day you believed, you had all the inheritance. Jesus had all of you. And one of these days, these things are coming together real soon. That's our blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look unto that. Live unto that. Know that's what we're all about here. And wherefore, because of that, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober in your thinking. Now, that doesn't mean that don't be drinking wine, which includes that. What this means is sobriety living, guys. You walk into churches today, and people want to lollygag and giggle, and they're talking about fun, fun, this, fun, this, and Jesus never comes up. Sobriety of thought, sobriety of where we are, sobriety of the nemesis being straight above your head. The fire of the dragons flying through the sky right now toward us. God's going to use its tail to destroy us. There's judgments on the way. It's already been released. It's too late for America. And people would laugh and giggle in the foyer of the church and never mention Jesus and talk about Jesus and talk about God or nothing because they can't after two minutes. Because they're not the Sunday school teacher. Now, our Sunday school teacher, he can really get into it. Boy, my Sunday school teacher, he can talk about God. God's calling you and me to be able to talk about God because that has become all of our life. And we're to be sober-minded in what? Having lifted up our skirts that slow us down and drag us down in this race, in this war. Get that stuff out of our way so we can run, walk freely in sobriety of mind, thinking on the right things. And guys, you're not going to have a sober mind watching TV all the time. That is how Satan keeps us from God. You've got to understand this. We are holy. We're going to be studying that here in a second. We are separate, and we are called to be that and live that. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here is the command. We're being commanded right now by God through the Holy Ghost, through a man who God worked on and he finally figured it out. I need to decrease like his friend John the Baptist said, and he needs to increase. And Peter allowed that to happen when the Holy Ghost, God come in him. He said, you know, I have failed at everything I have tried. I'm going to quit trying and just yield to what the Holy Ghost wants to do inside of me. How the Holy Ghost wants to work this. How the Holy Ghost wants to preach this message. How the Holy Ghost wants to serve. And so we yield in sobriety, in in focus of mind. That's what that word means. Do everything in focus. In a sharp, clear, concise focus. Gird up the loins of your minds with focus. Under what? And hope for the end of the grace that is going to come to us in Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope, guys. The only thing we live for. I don't live for Friday 
A lot of people's goal in this world, at my work, at your work, is Friday. Friday at 5 o'clock or 3.30, whenever it is, they get a punch out. They live for that moment week after week after week, and it goes by. The next thing you know, Monday morning's here. Okay, so now i got to look to this this this, this uh, Friday. And I'm looking to this Friday at 5. Hey, we're getting closer. So we're downhill. It's Wednesday. It's downhill. We made it over the hump. Uh, uh, we're looking for 5 o'clock on Friday, man. 5 o'clock on Friday. And then all of a sudden, 7 o'clock on Monday gets here. And they got to do it again. And Jesus says, I need you to snap out of that stupidity, out of that temporary thinking, and get yourself into a solid foundational, solid thinking, a sure thinking, a foundational thought life, girding up your loins, getting all the encumbersome uh, trek out of your way, all the obstacles out of your way, and think soberly, think focused on this. Jesus Christ is coming to get us, and how did I live in the meantime? We need to focus ourselves on standing before him in judgment at every minute of every day, every time we do something. I am going to stand before the Lord. I want to finish my race well. I want to do this. And when you start trading all those worldly thoughts that the devil wants you doing, he wants you laughing and giggling at silly stuff. And then he wants you watching the rerun and laughing and giggling at that silly stuff again. And God wants us focusing on his mind and always thinking of his coming, his arrival, his having the inheritance in his hand, and me and this one, he's going to join us together. And then I'm going to send there at the judgment seat of Christ, and I don't want to be shamefaced. Now, now, guys, none of us in this room are going to be perfect at the judgment seat of Christ. But what we will have done, if we live soberly in the word of God, we will have known that Jesus was perfect, and I lived unto him, and I had him correcting my steps every step of the way, knowing that my mind and my girdle of truth was on, and I wore the belt of truth, and I had all the stuff that was going to slow me down inside the truth. Every, every step I took was inside truth. Every time I went to walk toward my bed, it was in truth. I walked toward the shower, it was in truth. I walked toward my car, it was in truth. I walked toward the bank teller, it was in truth. I walked toward the restaurant, it was in truth. I walked toward my friends, it was in truth. I had everything, my entire life walk was tucked up in the belt of truth as I walked. And I know that. And God helped me through that. And when I see truth personified, Jesus, he will have known where my clothing had been. He will have known where my wardrobe was, where my mind concerning my wardrobe was. People right now are concerned about their beach bodies and their beach tans and how good I'm going to look. You better consider how good you're going to look at the judgment seat of Christ because there's going to be a whole bunch of folks who's going to be ashamed because they didn't rightly divide truth, the word of truth. Guys, that's everything to God. And it's everything to God's man right here. And the very first thing he tells us after telling us how we can be saved and how we can go to heaven and what God has laid up for us, this is how you go about it. And wherefore, gird up the loins of the mind of yourself in truth. Be sober. Walk, walk in focus. Walk in holy focus. Everything you do is unto the hope and glory of seeing Jesus. Everything, everything, everything. Folks, have, have you gotten there yet? Is your thoughts, every one of us in here, you, you have thoughts that, that just overtake your mind all day long. All of us, all of us, all of us, we were made with obsessive thoughts. And our obsessive thought, God made it easy, was to be on him. If you'll just make him your target on these obsessive thoughts, man, you'll have you'll live in victory and die in victory. Be raptured in victory. You'll see him eternally in victory because you did what your mind was supposed to have done and focus it off of this obsessively and onto him obsessively. That's what we're called to do. And it's not a disorder. It's a gift. Obsessive compulsive disorder. 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 Just ask the Freud boys what they call your focus on Jesus. And they're writing it into law right now that people who have their mind preoccupied with God and religion and Jesus, they're nuts. And they've been saying this for years in the psychology office and psychiatry office. And Jesus told us the opposite in his word. He said, I'm telling you to, to gird up the loins of your mind in sobriety and truth unto this one thing. Always think on this. Jesus come back to get you and make that your wonderful hope. No matter how bad your day is, the Lord's going to come back. And I want him to find me rejoicing. I want to find me, have him find me faithful. I want to have him find me in truth. I want to have him find me unencumbered in my steps. As I walk holy and I believe the very first thing he said in doing was this. Guard your mind. Make your mind sharp. Make it focus and get everything out of its way that will slow you down. The devil wants to bring things along in our mind to get our mind off of Jesus, off of the word, off of, and to slow us down and trip us up. And Peter starts the entire conversation with this. Jesus, one day, he's going to reveal himself to us. 
He's already revealed himself to us in his word. The unveiling of the book of Revelation. The revelation is the apocalypse, the unveiling, the uncovering of Jesus Christ, who he is. You see, after he raptures us, we're going to be in heaven. That is Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. There was a door that was set before me, an open door, and I went through that door, come up hither. We heard a trump, and we went through that door, and we're up in heaven, and we see a lamb. One who is as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And nobody was worthy to open up this little book, this this deed. It had these seven seals on it. Nobody was op- able to open that. And, oh, we were wondering about that. And the angel said, hey, don't fear, man. That's the lamb. He's, he's worthy. He's worthy. And he pops the seals. And as he's popping the seals and the judgments are falling, the world, from the world view, they see a lion. From the heaven view, we see a lamb. And praise God, God is never going to judge us and be the lion of judgment against us. He's going to be the lion of judgment on our behalves. He's going to fight for us. He's going to, to defend us. He is going to pay everybody back for the evils they've done unto us. Remember those prayers of the saints that went forward and they're cast to earth and then earth is destroyed and the judgment later. All these things are for our glory, for our good and Jesus is looking after us. And we have a little lamb to take care of us because we trusted in the lamb. And they, when they look at him, they see a lion coming at him in rage and anger. We are a blessed people. And the revelation of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ reveals him. And most people in churches don't know him because they've never read the book of Revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. And you and I, when we read the revelation of Jesus Christ and the revelation of his scripture from Genesis to Revelation, he's revealed in every word, every yod, every period, every comma, everything in scripture is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And those of us who are faithful in reading that, and because we've sharpened our minds in that, we've focused our mind on that, we've determined that that's going to be our life. The Word of God is our life. One of the fallacies, guys, is that it's the preacher's job. And that is a fallacy when you don't listen to Jesus when he said, you're the preacher. You go into all the world and you preach the gospel to every preacher. You're the preacher. You're the proclaimer of righteousness. This ain't the pastor's job. This is your job. And when you finally take that focus on yourself, that responsibility on yourself, and you get your thinking and your thoughts right concerning that, you will have a blessed hope and you will love the fact that Jesus is about to come to you soon. If the idea of Jesus coming back to get you is an intrusion on your game plan, you have a wicked heart in mind. You see, the heart is wicked because the mind's wicked. It all begins in the mind. He didn't tell us to start with our heart, but we see that the heart is included a lot in Scripture. But it begins with our mind. Is your thinking right? Is your thinking stable? Is it in the scriptures? How much Bible did you read this last week? How much Bible have you read in the last month? This lets you know where your dress is. Is your dress tucked and you're ready for war? Or you got that long gown on and just slowing down and doesn't matter and lacks of days to go through life? Are you happy and joyful in the things of God? We talked about that last week. When you're in the presence of God, is a fullness of joy, and it's joy unspeakable and filled with glory, and the church is walking around without the glory of God in them. This is the oil that fills up the glory lamp inside your soul. We've got to keep this going, and that's what Peter's telling us right now. It's, it all starts with the Word. If your Christianity doesn't start at the Word, your Christianity is a bogus one. If your Christianity doesn't continue in the Word, it's a fake Christianity. And if your word doesn't end with the word, if your life doesn't end with the word, it's a Vatican Christianity and you're going to hell when you die. God's called us unto righteousness, his word, it's his word, it's his word. And be sober in that, be sharp in that. Guys, it's time to cut everything else out. Verse 14. As obedient children, we don't fashion ourselves according to the way we used to live before I got saved. You write up on a diagram who you were before you got saved. How you thought? Did you did you gossip? Did you complain? Did you whine? Did you bicker? Did you bellyache? Did you manipulate? Did you use people? Did you lie? Did you cheat? Did you steal? What did you used to do over here on the left? Now, right, what you do on the right is any of it the same? Is is any of it equivocable? Does it does it go together? Does it equate? It shouldn't. Nothing on the right should match anything on the left. Because I have now become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And what's so cool about being new is to all start out with a clean slate. Then none of the past is on that slate. Praise God. None of my past is there. When I get saved, I'm not a liar. I'm not a cheat. I'm not a scumbag. I'm not 
a, a wicked witch, a fortune teller, whatever I was over here, I'm not that when I, the day I get saved. But you know what happens? We begin to act like the old man over here because we won't get into the word of God, allowing it to change our hearts and minds, being focused and sharp, sharpened in his things. And we've not girded up the loins of our mind in truth with a purpose to advance forward with Jesus as he walks the word. Obedient or disobedient children? You see, a disobedient children will fashion themselves according to this world. Disobedient children are filling up the churches. We have more disobedient children in the church buildings today in America than we have obedient children. Now, they may all be children. You, you, you can't be a child of God unless you're saved. You, you come to the first 12 verses of First Peter and you trust that Jesus is the only way to get you to heaven and you've actually placed your faith in that truth. And now you've been washing the blood and you've saved, you're redeemed. Praise God, you are a child of God, but are you disobedient or are you obedient? An obedient one will focus their mind, sharpening it in the things of God, in his word, girding up the loins of their mind in sobriety, in truth, in waiting for the blessed hope of Jesus Christ to return. Everything I'm doing is about you, Lord. Therefore, I'm going to do everything through your word. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to see through it. I'm going to use all my five senses are now this word. What I touch, I'm going to touch things that are holy. What I see, I'm going to see things that are holy. What I smell, I'm going to invest in my ability. I'm going to smell things that are holy. I'm going to do everything in righteousness, Lord. I'm going to take that which was the old man. It's been converted by you and your blood. I'm a new creation, and I want to do what this says new creations do. And I want this to be my absolute roadmap for every step that I take on this planet, every thought that I have. Only, 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 or I'm disobedient. But Peter says, but as obedient children, do not fashion yourselves according to your former lust in your ignorance. Ignorance is, I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know Jesus. I, I, I was ignorant of what was in this book. See, one of the problems with many people sitting in pews, and now it's not pews, it's fancy seats. In what we call churches, they're disobedient children and they're still ignorant. You can ask them, what was Genesis about? That's just the first book. What do you find in Genesis? Well, that's where God created the world, Noah's flood. Most of them will skip that whole chapter six, you know, where the sons of God made it with the daughters of earth and changed this whole existence and your whole existence ain't what you think it is right now because you don't know that chapter. It's just the sixth chapter, like the sixth day, like the number of man. Your ignorance is killing you. Your ignorance is causing you to be disobedient, church. Not necessarily the people in this room, but maybe you might be one of those. The word of God is going to touch every one of us the way it's going to touch us. I pray that you are obedient. I pray that you're not ignorant. I pray that the very reason we get in here and preach the next verse after verse so we won't be ignorant when we leave here. And we won't ignore the truth that we've heard, but we will, with sharp focus, sharp mind, with our loins of our mind girded up, Truth on, everything tucked inside of truth, everything that we do operates from truth, the word of God, Jesus himself, and all everything that I do, everything that I do is with the anticipation of this coming with my promise. And I'm going to see and he'll be revealed. That's, that's it. Otherwise, I'm disobedient and ignorant. Let's not be that today. Verse 15. But, as he which called you, so but what? We don't want you to be like the old man. We don't want you to be ignorant. We don't want you to be disobedient. But as he which has called you, Jesus Christ has called you, as he is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of living. Every breath you take, every bite you eat, every step you take, everything you see, everything you do, do all to the glory of God. Are you mature or immature? Are you ignorant? Or are you understanding the things of God? Are you obedient or disobedient? You must answer this today. You must get sober about the answers. And the answers better so sober you up under the righteousness of God because you're about to meet this wonderful Jesus who is holy, who commanded you to be holy. What is holy? You ask people what holy is. Why, they picture none. They picture a priest. And then they can't picture a priest anymore because they're all pedophiles and wicked, and the world knows it. What's what's holy? Uh, that's a monk who secluded himself from the world. See, that the very first Buddha, that's what he did. He secluded himself from all the per perils and pain and atrocities of the world, secluded himself, and he found great peace in that. Somebody might call that holy. 
Well, what does God call holy? What is holy? Holy is severed and separate. What is holy? We think of holy, 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 and it's very important. Because everything God does stems from his holiness. It's important to understand what this word means. And in the scriptures, he doesn't say love, 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 because that's what they're preaching behind the pulpits all day long. His love is important. God is love, but it stems from his holy, holy, holiness. Everything stems from God's holiness. It's important to know what holiness is. It means severed and separated unto himself. You know what would be an example of holy? Me taking a butcher knife and cutting my thumb off. That's holy. It has been severed and it no longer part of the whole. God is unlike everything in the whole of his universe. He's out there severed from it all by himself. No umbilical, no ties, no likings. Everything about this universe he hates right now at the moment. It's not of him. Man cursed it all when man sinned and God is separated from that. In his righteousness, when he said this, he said, I don't want to leave you apart from me. I want to make you holy too. I want to sever your umbilical to Babylon. I want to cut off all your ties to sinful Egypt. I want to remove you from hell. And I want you out here with me. And in God's love, he's severed. He's away from everything. He's so holy and so righteous. He's called us out there to where he is. And he declared us that we're holy. Now you're holy. The day we got saved, the day I accepted Jesus, the day I understood that I was no longer going to have to go to hell. And now Jesus is my Savior. And I'm never going to be leaving his hand. That very day, he declared me to be holy. And guys, he declares us holy, and therefore I am holy because of the declaration. And I am no longer part of this world because I've been saved, and my spirit cannot sin, does not sin, does not want to sin. I am separated out there with him. Now he says, I want you to live like it. I want you to, on purpose, take every thought of your old nature, your old man, and that which you know I abhor, don't bring it out here with me. You leave all that in Babylon. You leave your old man, you leave your lust, you leave your desires, you leave your thoughts, you leave your selfishness, you leave everything there that has nothing to do with me out here. And Satan wants us taking the whole enchilada out there with us and calling it church. God is separated. Do you think God in him is unrighteousness? Do you think in him is unfairness? In him is unrighteousness? Do you think any of that is in him? No, because he's holy. He's very special. He's severed from all of that. He's opposed to all that. He's out there all by himself away from that. One of the greatest miracles in the world, guys, is this. And you know it to be true in your lives. God who's separate, out there all by himself, decided he'd come here in the middle of all this mess. And he put on flesh, made from dirt, and the command from the Father to the Son was this. When you get there, you're not going to be and act and think as God. So you are. Your mission is to be a man. And you're going to represent man. You're going to get hungry like man. You're going to get thirsty like man. You're going to get tired like man. You're going to get wore out like man. You're going to need sleep like man. When you're a baby, your mom's going to change your diapers and feed you. You're going to be helpless as a man. Everything you do is going to be as a man. And when you go fast for 40 days, you're going to be like a man. And the devil's going to come along, and he's going to try to get you to do things his way. And you can go all God on him. Don't go God on him. You stay man on him. And you overcome that devil through the word just like any man on the planet will and would. And that was his command, and that was his order. That's what he had to do. Some people preach, oh, when he fought temptation, he was fighting sin. He wasn't fighting sin. There's no sin in him. That's heresy. He's impeccable. He, Jesus Christ, cannot sin, could not sin. It's not in him to sin, but what he could do was be God. He could do that easily because he was God, but his mission when he came here was, don't you dare do it. You rely on me. You pray to me. You talk to me. You have me do the work, and you have me do the leading. And Jesus, when he got here, he said, I do nothing of myself. I do whatever the Father tells me to do because he was a great example of what holiness on this planet as a man is. And as I am holy, you be that same way. And what we want to do, we want to go rogue and sinful. We want to do what we're able to do back to our past. Jesus said, I need you away from that, and that's our command. As Jesus was commanded to be a man, you and I are commanded to be holy. And we meet at the cross. There's Jesus and there I am. 
I'm an un- uh, unholy man, a wicked man, and he's a holy man, and he's called a seraph. And he refuses to act and, and destroy the world and call the angels to free him up from these bad guys. He allows himself to be taken like a man, to be punished for man, for all of us. And at that cross, we are all made holy. And we've been called out there to that very special separate place with him, severed without any ties to this place. Has God showed you at this moment what, you have, what you're tied to in this world? What has he been telling you to let go of and you haven't yet? The command today is you better be holy as I am holy. That's the command. These are commands from chapter chapter 1, verse 13 on our commands, how the Christian is supposed to live, not suggestions. This is how you're going to do it if you're going to do it. But as he which has called you, aren't you thankful he called you by name? He called me at the cross. He called us unto salvation. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Aren't you thankful he called you? And as he who called you is holy, out there separate, be holy. One of the greatest miracles is this. When God, Jesus Christ, can come into a wicked world, find wicked men, call them out there unto his holiness, they sever everything they got, and then they can come back into this wicked mess and it not affect them, and they hate every bit of it while they're here. That's a miracle. And that's got at work in the holy man's life. Are you there? While you live here in Babylon, do you hate everything about Babylon except the people and the dying souls? Have you severed yourself from everything in Babylon except that? That which ties you out there to the holiness of God, the umbilical to heaven, the umbilical to faith, the umbilical to the rewards, the the umbilical to that blessed hope that we're about to see. Everything is this book and him and there's nothing else. You've been called unto that, guys. If you're going to be successful and you're going to meet Jesus with a smile on your heart and on your face, you will have been holy because you will have been obedient and not ignorant. Obedient children versus disobedient ones. Ignorant ones versus those who know. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Whoever the sun sets free is set free indeed. And the greatest miracle is when he saves people and they hate the world. Are you there? I pray your maturity in Jesus Christ has brought you to that miracle. Because Jesus Christ is a miracle-working God, and the greatest miracle is that. God taking wicked men, making them righteous, and setting them among wicked men, and they remain righteous. Be a miracle today. Be holy. Be obedient. Be a good son. Be a good child. Be obedient. Be holy. Even as he that saved you and called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, is holy in all manner of conversation. Don't you dare go to work and act a little bit differently than you acted here in church today. Don't you go out there with a few of your chosen friends and be just a little more risque and a little different, a a little more off color, as they say in Asia, a little green. Don't be a little green anywhere you go. You be the same yesterday, today, forever like your Father in Heaven is who's called you to be holy unto Himself. And it's His holiness that's doing its work in you because you have severed yourself from everything in Babylon and you've allowed yourself to be out there where He is. And when you got out there, He said, now I need to go back and keep yourself unsettled. Keep yourself separate, keep yourself untied from that world. And we say, yes, sir. And we come back in holiness in all manner of lifestyle. You see, I love that old King James word, conversation. Because everything you do is a conversation. Now, folks may not have been in on the beginning of the conversation, and they may interpret it wrong. At the point they see it, they might see you doing something, they oh, judge, judge, that's why we're never supposed to judge nobody. But when they see the whole of you from beginning to end, they see the thought process, they see your game planning, your scheming, your actions, what's the final result of that? God says, I want to be holy. And it's command, be it. I've declared you holy at cross. You you wanted to go to heaven so that only holy people get to go to heaven. And you're not holy by yourself. I declare you holy. So now be that. Be what I've declared you. And what is that? Knowing the word, severing ourselves from everything in Babylon, in the world, cutting all ties to what makes them laugh, to what makes them tick, to what turns them on, to their lifestyles, their conversation. And we have a holy conversation. All of it. Are you there? I pray you are. The word, a hunger for the word, will get you there fastest only. Verse 16. He says it again. 
because it is written over 80 times in Scripture. Be hope. I am holy. Not a suggestion in Christianity. Christians, this is a command from your commander, your chief, your God, the one in whom you have all your blessed hope placed. If his coming back today is an intrusion on your lifestyle, you have a wicked heart. It started with a wicked mind. Get your thinking out of the place where he called me to the cross, he saved me, and from that cross, we go on, we grow on out there in holiness. He sends me back into this wicked place, and we live righteously here because his spirit is in us, flowering, blooming, producing fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And he's doing a work in me, and while I'm here in Babylon, all I'm doing is desiring him in heaven and desiring myself to be there with him soon, having completed my mission. Don't hurry life along. People want to come along with suicide and say, I just want to be with God. Don't do that. You don't want to be with God. You're selfish and you not listen to his game plan. There's a point unto men once to die, a date for you to die. You're going to die on that date. Let it happen and you serve God and be severed from the world in the meantime. Live holy, live holy, be holy, be holy in all manner of conversation because it, as it is written, you be holy, God says, for I am holy. Are we in him? Are we his sons? Is he our father? Is father like son? Is son like father? Like father, like son? Is that you? Peter says, it better be. It better be. I was before the cross, Peter says, and you saw what I did, what I didn't do. Then he saw me after the cross. He wasn't perfect. He had to be rebuked by the scripture. What we read in from Paul is scripture. Peter was rebuked from scripture when he was wrong. And you and I have that same scripture that rebukes us when we're wrong. What was the rebuking? Being two-faced. Acting two different ways with two different groups of people instead of being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Being free in my salvation. Being not ignorant in the truth that I know being an obedient son because I know all the word and I'm staying faithful to it. God wants to save your soul as he has saved your spirit. Let him. And the fastest track is the word of God, not being ignorant of it and being obedient to every bit of it. Do not be a stiff neck. Do not have a hard heart and do not be proud. God resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Grace is what it's all about, guys. Grace is that gift that saved us. What is grace? God giving us things that we just don't deserve. I don't deserve to have my left side cleaned up and removed and forgotten. I don't deserve to have a new slate that's clean and we can God can add things to my virtue, knowledge, knowledge, patience, patience, hope. I don't deserve that. But he's doing it. He's going to reward me according to that because he changed me into that. And he's doing the work through me to do these things. I couldn't do these on my own. And I read the word and it corrects me. And oh, I didn't know that was wrong, Lord. And I didn't know my attitude was wrong. And sometimes I, I know I've got a bad attitude. And guys, the sooner you just adjust and confess your wickedness to God, you'll grow faster and your mind will become sharper and your soul will be more saved today than it was yesterday. Unto the saving of your souls. How do we do that? I recognize that I follow a holy one who's called me to be holy. He's declared me and now he's commanding me to live in that holiness separate unto him. I am different. I, I am not like anybody else at my work, unless they're Christians out there in holiness with me. We're so unlike him. And it's not the fact that we come up on them and we're, I'm holy and you're not. I'm just separate from you and I don't participate in your sin and you're going to hate me because of that. That's why we're separated because you don't want nothing to do with me. I love you. You're the only thing I'm supposed to love on this planet. And they won't love you back. Be holy anyway. Among the unholy. As he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If you don't know that you're going to heaven today, God wants you in heaven. He did everything he could to get you to heaven. He saved you. He's your savior. Jesus' name means the salvation of Jehovah. And the salvation of Jehovah, Jesus wants to save you today. Do you want to be saved? The question is not, do you want to go to heaven when you die? The question is, do you want to be saved from you? Are you sick of you yet? Are you tired of the things you're doing that's sending you to hell? Do you want to be saved? Do you want God? He wants you. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. And if you'll just believe in the fact that Jesus died for you, 
that he rose from the dead for you, and that he's coming back to save you with that same promise. If you believe that in your heart, the Bible says, call on him today while he may be found. And he can be found today. He's listening. He wants to save you. You call unto him, you believe those things. You say, Jesus, I believe that you came here to earth for me. You died for me because I deserve hell and you took it on yourself. I deserve the punishment and you took that on you. And I know you did and I believe that. I believe your blood. And I want you to cover me with your blood. And you pray that and you say, Jesus, save me now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I hope everybody here is saved. I hope you're saved.